It's late 1939. Nuclear fission has recently been discovered. Mitsubishi is developing the Navy Type 0 fighter plane, and Hitler has just invaded Poland. The world is at war. And in Hollywood, Herman J. Mankiewicz and Orson Welles are starting a war of their own. The battle over Citizen Kane. For a while, Mankiewicz had been toying with the idea of telling a man's private life, preferably one that suggested a recognizable American figure, immediately following his death, through the intimate and often incompatible testimony of those who had known him at different times and in different circumstances. After discarding inspiration from figures such as Howard Hughes, Mank and Orson settled on William Randolph Hearst as the main inspiration. Hearst was an infamous newspaper magnate at the time, known for his ruthless business practices, extortionary tendencies, and significant influence over politics. For over 50 years, he had been a tenant of the American press and yellow journalism, maintaining great power over the country. And Mank had first-hand knowledge of this, since he'd been, through Hollywood acquaintances, part of Hearst's social circle. Upon hearing that a potentially damaging, thinly-veiled movie about his life was being made, Hearst mobilized his influence over Hollywood to stop Citizen Kane from seeing the light of day, even blackmailing studio heads to force them to destroy the film. But he failed, and Citizen Kane went on to become a cultural landmark, often regarded as one of America's greatest films. On top of that, it left an indelible stain on Hearst's public image. It didn't help that the film, born out of Mank's keen cultural observations of the elite and Wells' flair for dramatic and theatrical storytelling, was a cinematic masterwork. The screenplay crafted multiple intimate portraits of fictional magnate Charles Foster Kane through the memory of the few people who loved him, all the while the camera monumentally frames him with the weight of history. Charles Foster Kane may not be real, but he perfectly captured the omnipresent essence of people like Hearst, both in the private and the public realm. Indeed, Kane, just like Hearst, is larger than life. Every creative choice portrays him not so much as a person but as a terrible god among men, powerfully bending reality to his own will. It almost seems flattering, empowering, apotheosic. Eighty years later, Christopher Nolan released Oppenheimer, an equally grand biopic about the eponymous lead scientist behind the creation of the atomic bomb. Like with Citizen Kane, there was a lot of controversy surrounding this movie, including a lot of hot takes about the ethics of telling this story this particular way. First, were the preemptive takes warning against making a spectacle out of what directly caused the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. Then, were the co-occurring reviews questioning the choice to further mythologize such a terrible figure. I'm even seeing both of those kinds of takes about Ridley Scott's upcoming Napoleon epic and it's not even out yet. Why, people ask, should we sympathize with the devil? You can probably already see where I'm going with this. Friendly reminder that Charles Foster Kane was literally a Nazi, as a mage, here comes Orson Welles glorifying yet another billionaire asshole thread. Here's why you shouldn't support Citizen Kane, one out of 27. <laughs> I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. Okay. I really loved Oppenheimer, just like I adore Citizen Kane. And not just because I'm thirsting over young Orson Welles, although I could fix him. Just like I adore lots of other works about these great bad men who have not for the better, but for the worse, shaped the world that we live in. And I haven't been able to stop wondering, why do we tell stories of great bad men? And, well, should we? For a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, 
face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. Greatness is probably one of the most elusive qualities one can aspire to. Mostly because it doesn't just depend on how people perceive you, but on how history will. And, as we all know, you have no control who lives, who dies, and who tells your story. Oops, here's the engagement bait. Stick around for some Hamilton hot takes. Is that still driving clicks? I hope so. <laughs> Salim is, is staring out at the green light, too. Look who also believes in the green light. <laughs> she doesn't like this, she doesn't like this! But how are we to understand greatness? What does this oh-so-elusive quality actually entail? Greatness can have many different definitions, but I would like to focus on its very literal connotation of figurative immortality. A great life lives forever. It transcends its present, often overwhelmingly so. It exists on a form of what historian Mircea Eliot calls sacred time. For Eliot, the ancient man experienced reality by way of two types of time, the profane and the sacred. Profane time was where the ordinary day-to-day -day time happened as perceived by the people, you know, a sort of mortal, finite time. Meanwhile, sacred time was where the cyclically mystical moments of communion with the divine happened. This meant religious festivities, where myths were annually retold and, therefore, inhabited. Mircea Eliot gives us the example of the ancient Babylonians who, every year during their New Year festivities, would publicly recite their creation myth. But they weren't just retelling some story. In revisiting creation, creation would happen all over again for them. It was an just a way to keep faith and communion alive, but it allowed for a brief exit out of the mortal realm and into divinity. <laughs> the cider is getting to me, that's why I'm gesticulating so much. This is shockingly similar to the way that we still engage with history nowadays. I mean, we still have our religious festivities and pagan rituals, such as Christmas or New Year's Eve. And indeed, in Colombia, we have a tradition called the Novenas. For the nine days leading up to Christmas Day, we gather with our families and friends to retell just a little piece of the story of Jesus' birth. This is a way to vicariously relieve the story of Mary and Joseph making it out to Bethlehem, to endure the hard conditions that they had to suffer through along with them, to commune with the divine leading up to Christmas Day. So we still celebrate religious rituals that way, but think about Independence Days or commemorative dates or the relationship that Americans have with 9-11. Cyclically, every year, there is a call to collectively relive the events of that day in order to not forget them. So great moments in history are sacred time too. They intersect with all of history, always a part of it, and yet, at the same time, apart from it. Historian and philosopher Hannah Arendt argues that this particular relationship with historical figures and events, instead of just myths, was born with the invention of writing and, most importantly, literacy. You know what I think of history? The more I read, the more I wonder. When something is written down, does that make it true? From that moment on, words were no longer limited to a specific time and place, but rather they were able to transcend time, space, and mortality. History is born with writing. That was the expansion of the public realm. <laughs> I got too excited, I haven't even explained what the public realm yet is. Okay, so Aaron proposed that there are two realms in which us human beings divide our experiences. There is the private realm, our own inner world, in direct opposition to the public realm. In her words, To live together in the world means, essentially, that a world of things is between those who have it in common as a table is located between those who sit around it. The world, like every in-between, relates and separates men at the same time. That's the public realm. That table in between all of us. What can and is seen by everybody. 
With the invention of history by way of writing, the public realm was no longer confined to just the immediate present, but rather could expand into both past and future. The good thing is that the more I drink, the more I fit the character. As opposed to its more individual private counterpart, the people tend to be a much more cohesive unit within the public realm. That is, of course, save for those who stand out above the masses, the great men of their time, the public figures that are destined to history. One of the earliest examples of this, in fact, often called the first individual in history, is Egyptian pharaoh King Akhenaten. Pharaohs in general were already deeply concerned with immortality, hence why such mighty monuments were built to them in life. However, King Amenhotep IV and his queen Nefertiti took this to a whole new level when they converted the Egyptian religion from polytheistic to monotheistic. Mind you, up until this point, pharaohs were believed to be children of Ra and incarnations of the god Horus, divine intermediaries between mortals and gods. But in unifying religious worship under a single new god, Aten, the idea of the sun disk, and in renaming himself as the effective of the Aten, Amenhotep IV, now Akhenaten, elevated his role further. He was no longer just a king, he was immortal in life. In the words of Egyptologists Colleen and John Darnell, the ancient Egyptians believed that to be remembered was to attain immortality. When Akhenaten and Nefertiti lived, the pyramids of Giza were already over a thousand years old, and they had every reason to expect that their own monuments would be standing millennia after their death. What they didn't expect is that their son Tutankhamen would reverse the sacrilegious switch to monotheism. Monuments erected to the greatness of Akhenaten and Nefertiti were destroyed, and their names erased from historical records to punish their hubris with absolute oblivion. In spite of this, the capital city that Akhenaten built to his name was found in the late 19th century, and his story was finally revealed to the world. Despite later pharaohs' attempts to erase Akhenaten and Nefertiti from history, the royal couple's desire for immortality has, in the end, been fulfilled. This goes to show us that immortality can never really be a personal decision. At the end of the day, it's posterity which will be the ultimate judge of greatness. Posterity as in history, as in the public realm, as in other people. That's when telling stories of great men becomes important. In October of 1922, writer F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife Zelda moved to Great Neck, New York on the coast of Long Island. As opposed to the old money area of Manhasset Neck across the bay, Great Neck was a nouveau riche community of recently wealthy but uncultured entertainers and criminals. Very fitting, because Fitzgerald himself did not really come from money. The Fitzgerald's neighbor in this nouveau riche community was an eccentric but enigmatic man by the name of Max Gerlach. German born but American raised, he had enjoyed an Oxford education and was even related to the German Kaiser himself. He was a local personality who regularly threw lavish parties in his large mansion in a massive display of wealth. It was even said that he never wore the same shirt twice. However, that whole backstory wasn't, well, real. He was a German immigrant, but he was not related to the German Kaiser, nor did he receive an Oxford education. These were all lies to better appeal to high society. In reality, Gerlach actually had an enviable Rax Riches story. He had worked as a sailor and a mechanic until he enlisted to fight in World War I, after which he became involved with alcohol trafficking from Cuba during the Prohibition. Soon, he made millions of dollars as a bootlegger, hence this massive fortune. In the end, Max Gerlach was an immigrant who made it big in the United States and was now living it up in the mansion that he had earned, even if illegally. That's... that's just the American dream. But, and you probably caught on to this already, it's not really Max Gerlach that history remembers despite his apparent greatness. I mean... Who has ever heard of the Great Gerlach? 
Fitzgerald had already been toying around with the idea of telling a story about the unfairness of a poor young man not being able to marry a girl with money, since he had lived this story himself. His observations on the social role of wealth, combined with his neighbor's story and a high-profile murder case at the time, eventually converged in The Great Gatsby. The novel follows Nick Carraway, a young, up-and-coming bond salesman who moves to New York and ends up infatuated with his rich neighbor, Jay Gatsby. Gatsby is famous for throwing extravagant parties every week attended by the rich, the nouveau riche, and the populace alike. The larger-than-life man is an enigma, since his backstory is made up of all sorts of rumors and hearsays. Nick slowly befriends Gatsby, learning that he had built his fortune with one specific goal in mind, to finally impress Daisy, a rich heiress with whom he fell in love as a teenager and who he had no real chance to marry. Every night, he stares at the green light at the end of Daisy's dock at the other side of the bay, hoping she will one day show up to one of his parties, which he throws just for her. Yes? One can hardly blame Fitzgerald for this almost invasive exploration of the social dynamics that surrounded him. There is, after all, something invariably fascinating about people like this. This is why Mank and Fitzgerald observed Hearst and Gerlach, or why everyone gravitated towards Kane and Gatsby. A larger-than-life life is simply too captivating. One of the things that's most impressive to Nick Carraway, for example, is the way Gatsby's will has shaped his own destiny, to the point that he got to where he was despite his background. He fought for his spot in the public realm as opposed to those who simply inherited it. He earned it. The truth was that Jay Gatsby of West Eglon Island sprang from his platonic conception of himself. He was a son of God, a phrase which, if it means anything, means just that. And he must be about his father's business the service of a vast, vulgar, and meretricious beauty. So he invented just the sort of Jay Gatsby that a 17-year-old boy would be likely to invent. And to this conception, he was faithful to the end. That's the appeal of the American dream. It's social mobility, it's financial success, it's historical notoriety. Wait, is it? Once again, one cannot truly create historical notoriety for oneself because that's history's job and that barrier becomes increasingly evident the more people focus not on the public realm, but on their own signifiers of success. As Hannah Arendt wrote, There is perhaps no clearer testimony to the loss of the public realm than the almost complete loss of authentic concern with immortality, testified to by the current classification of striving for immortality with the private vice of vanity. Under modern conditions, it is indeed so unlikely that anybody should earnestly aspire to an earthly immortality that we probably are justified in thinking it is nothing but vanity. No one really remembers Max Gerlach other than as a mere footnote on the genuinely great The Great Gatsby. The title itself almost becomes a bit of a cruel joke on both his and the protagonist's fate. Gerlach was eventually arrested after which he lost all his money during the Depression and a suicide attempt left him blind. He lived the rest of his life in lonely poverty and in the shadow of a fictional great man who was, in the end, much more real than the image he had created for himself. Gatsby got the kinder ending. His shot in his own pool as a direct result of his foolish devotion to Daisy Buchanan and to the lifestyle meant to win her over. When you are merely concerned with signifiers of greatness, the emptiness eventually makes it all collapse underneath. But therein lies the tragedy. He took out a pile of shirts and began throwing them, one by one, before us, shirts of sheer linen and thick silk and fine flannel, which lost their folds as they fell and covered the table in many-colored disarray. While we admired, he brought more and the soft, rich heap mounted higher, shirts with stripes and scrolls and plaids in coral and apple green and lavender and faint orange and monograms of Indian blue. Suddenly, with a strained sound, Daisy bent her head into the shirts and began to cry stormily. They're such beautiful shirts. She sobbed, her voice muffled in the thick folds. It makes me sad because I've never seen such 
such beautiful shirts before. This is not the life that Gatsby had wanted for himself, and Nick, who is clearly in love with him by the way, knows this. To him, what makes Gatsby great were never the luxury or the fortune, but rather the love that drove him, that he had forever wed his unutterable visions to Daisy's perishable breath. We shook hands and I started away. Just before I reached the hedge, I remembered something and turned around. They're a rotten crowd, I shouted across the lawn. You're worth the whole damn bunch put together. I've always been glad I said that. In Citizen Kane, we have a subject who was also largely motivated by love and compassion, but a much more vague version of it. On the other hand, I am the publisher of the Inquirer. As such, it's my duty and I'll let you in on a little secret. It's also my pleasure to see to it that decent, hard-working people in this community aren't robbed blind by a pack of money-mad pirates just because they haven't anybody to look after their interests. Charles Foster Kane wants greatness by way of the love of the people. As we see him strive for this, we actually get a behind-the-scenes look at what it takes for a person to get to that position, practically destroying the lives of everyone around them. The cost of love is, well, love. Hearst himself was keen on achieving greatness. His plan was bold, and it would take him a long way. Hearst was making a paper for the poor who never had one. The immigrants, the working masses, they would be his readers, and he would be their champion. He meant to raise the name of Hearst to heights his father never dreamed of. If that made enemies along the way, well, that was too bad for them. The actions were noble, the intentions were not. And then the actions were not noble either. He was, like, full of shit. The working man and the slum child know they can expect my best efforts in their interests. The decent, ordinary citizens know that I'll do everything in my power to protect the underprivileged, the underpaid, and the underfed. Kane, Hurst, Gerlach, Gadsby, they all pursued some form of niche on the public realm but they all got lost somewhere along the way. You don't care about anything except you. You just want to persuade people that you love them so much that they ought to love you back. Only you want love on your own terms. It's something to be played your way according to your rules. Whether it is actually achieved or not, there is a cost to even attempting greatness. One that piques our curiosity as an audience because of the value that society places on greatness in the first place. What is it that makes these pursuits seem worth it? And what price are we willing to pay? Toast, Jedediah, to love on my terms. Those are the only terms anybody ever knows. His own. Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to man. For this, he was chained to a rock and tortured for eternity. <sighs> I would like to address all the allegations. I am just a mere titan and I've made some mistakes. And let me tell you that cancel culture has just gone too far. In Greek mythology, Prometheus was a titan who stole fire from the god Sober at Mount Olympus in order to give it to humans. Zeus, king of the gods, punished him for this offense by chaining him to a rock for all eternity. Every day, an eagle, the symbol of Zeus, would swoop in, carve out Prometheus' liver, and eat it. Overnight, his liver would grow back, and the punishment would begin all over again the next day. Now, there are three ways to read this story in terms of what it means thematically, especially within the context of this essay. One, based on a reading by Hesiod, is that by stealing godly fire and giving its power to humans, Prometheus destroyed mankind's original happy state, introducing a deadly weapon into the mortal world and dooming us forever with its capacity for violence. In this case, Prometheus was punished for ultimately harming mankind. Two, based on a reading by Aeschylus, Prometheus stole literal fire from gatekeeping gods and, along with it, the figurative spark for wisdom and reason, 
which gave way to science, engineering, and progress among humans. Here, he was specifically punished for stealing from the gods and defying their monopoly over power. However, this turned him into a tragic figure, a sort of rebellious martyr for mankind. Prometheus was already a complex figure back in ancient Greece. Despite him being punished by the all-powerful gods, he was also often worshipped alongside them, particularly Athena, goddess of wisdom, and Hephaestus, god of the forge. This meant that he was vital for engineering and innovation. On top of that, later Roman traditions introduced Prometheus as literally the creator of mankind, having made the first humans out of clay. This complicates the matters even further, mind you, because fire is necessary to harden clay, but if untempered, it can also crack it. In this metaphor, fire has the potential to both create and destroy clay and humans along with it. This takes us to the third way to read the story, that Prometheus both rightfully stole fire from the gods and along with it, science, engineering, and progress, and he introduced a deadly weapon to mankind. He gave immortal technology to mortal beings, and they too would suffer the consequences. This ends up being the most complete way to read the myth, that there can't be any sort of scientific progress without some form of danger. I'm showing nipple. Does this, does this do anything? Is there like a classical OnlyFans that I'm losing money on by not establishing? Anyway, for just 10 drachmas a month, be sure to subscribe. Things, as always, get even more interesting when we bring Christianity into the equation. Since, you know, there are obvious comparisons to be made with Lucifer, literally meaning bringer of light, or the snake at the Garden of Eden. They are corruptive forces that tempt humanity and lure them away from God with the promise of deeper knowledge. Early Roman Christian writers even cast Prometheus as the first sculptor and therefore the maker of the first pagan idols. This was a common interpretation throughout the Middle Ages and helped the myth survive in the cultural consciousness. At the same time, however, the image of Prometheus as creator of mankind was highly influential over early and medieval Christian art, with some pieces even portraying him alongside God. While God creates the universe, Prometheus creates man. He is the spark of human ingenuity that completes the act of creation, a fascinating humanistic reading that replaced the more pessimistic one during the Renaissance. Eventually, all these interpretations converge in Prometheus as a symbol of hubris, his punishment the consequence of the relentless pursuit of reason. Says art historian Olga Raggio of the conclusion of 15th century writers that the torture of Prometheus is the torment brought by reason itself to man, who is made by it many times more unhappy than the brutes. It is after having stolen one beam of the celestial light and having reached the heights of contemplation that the soul feels as if fastened by chains and beset by the continuous gnawing of inquiry, the most ravenous of vultures. Only death can release her bonds. The Romantic period in the late 18th century brought back and strengthened the portrait of Prometheus as a tragic figure, culminating famously so, in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is subtitled The Modern Prometheus. I have gone beyond that. I have discovered the great ray that first brought life into the world. Oh. Dr. Frankenstein literally uses unnatural science to bring a dead man to life, and in doing so, he creates two monsters, the creature and himself. This leads us to the hot topic at hand. <laughs> I keep saying it like Wendy Williams. This leads us to the hot topic at hand, J. Robert Oppenheimer, who is compared to Prometheus from the very start of the Christopher Nolan movie and in the source material. Oppenheimer is based on the biography of the scientist named American Prometheus, the triumph and tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. But the comparison didn't start there. J. Robert Oppenheimer was first referred to as Prometheus in the September 1945 issue of Scientific Monthly, 
where they wrote that modern Prometheans have raided Mount Olympus again and have brought back for man the very thunderbolts of Zeus. A month earlier, the United States dropped two atomic bombs, the first of their kind over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as the United States' final act of aggression of World War II. Japan surrendered six days later. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by United States forces resulted in an estimated death toll of 226,000 people, the vast majority of which were civilians. Therefore, this constituted a terrible war crime unlike any other single act of warfare in human history. The uranium and plutonium gun-type fission bombs detonated over Japan were the first nuclear bombs ever created, developed and built by the Manhattan Project, a top-secret project helmed by J. Robert Oppenheimer. He was the central figure behind the overall project and, given the accounts of everyone involved with it, the person who got the bombs from a theoretical possibility to a physical reality. So if Oppenheimer is Prometheus and the atomic bomb is fire, then what is his rock? What is his torture? What is his punishment? If this is how Christopher Nolan starts the movie, we have to assume that from its point of view, there is one. Prometheus ASMR. Let's start with the basics. Should Oppenheimer even be punished in the first place? Fire, while dangerous, is useful in positive ways. So this comparison implies that the atomic bomb was also useful, and positively so. What were these uses? We are briefly going to entertain the notion that the bombs were useful in their intention to bring World War II to an early end, in which case the argument could be made that the positive effect was to save lives on the long term and avoid further bloodshed. This was certainly the impression that Oppenheimer seems to have had at the time, not just in regards to World War II, but to potential future wars as well. The development of the atomic bomb was seen as a way to stop warfare in general. The war should not end without the world knowing about this primordial new weapon. The worst outcome would be if the gadget remained a military secret. If that happened, then the next war would almost certainly be fought with atomic weapons. We have to forge ahead, to the point where the gadget can be tested. Although we would all be destined to live in perpetual fear, a bomb might also end all war. Mind you, this pertains specifically to the development of the bomb, not its use on Japanese cities. Oppenheimer went on to admit that We didn't know beans about the military situation in Japan. We didn't know whether they could be caused to surrender by other means or whether the invasion was really inevitable. But in the back of our minds was the notion that the invasion was inevitable because we had been told that. In reality, this wasn't the case. Even President Truman, Eisenhower, and several other key figures later admitted so. By the time the bomb had been finished, Japan was near surrender already. The real purpose of the bombings was to demonstrate American exceptionalism not just to Japan, but to the Soviet Union as well. For the United States to instill fear into its enemies with a full display of force and showing them what they were capable of. The Hiroshima bomb was used against an essentially defeated enemy. It is a weapon for aggressors, and the elements of surprise and terror are as intrinsic to it as the fissible nuclei. And even if one were okay with the near-instant murder of hundreds of thousands of civilians for tactical purposes, this one specific case didn't make any sense. And even without hypothesizing on how much longer World War II would have lasted without the bombings, the mere act of them did not really end war itself as Oppenheimer had wanted to do. As proven by subsequent wars in Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and currently Ukraine and occupied Palestine, the existence of nuclear weapons merely adds yet another layer of fear to modern warfare. It doesn't really end it. The real benefits of Oppenheimer's work with the Manhattan Project weren't really military, but energetic. This work was vital for the development of nuclear energy, expensive doors that were opened thanks to the support of a wartime economy. 
This is the real value of this pursuit for knowledge. But in the concrete terms of the war, there's no real trolley problem argument to be had here. Oppenheimer still chose to not just participate, but lead an effort of mass murder against civilians, which haunted him for the rest of his life. He knew this was the endgame of the project, but he chose to continue with it. As he said to scientists at Los Alamos who were concerned about the ethical consequences of the bomb after Germany's surrender, It is clear that we, as scientific men, have no proprietary rights, no claim to special competence in solving the political, social, and military problems presented by the advent of atomic power. I guess he was just following orders. But we don't even have to look to magazines, biographies, or movies for the mythological comparisons, since it was Oppenheimer himself who first elevated his own deeds to the realm of the divine. He famously said that, upon witnessing the first test of the atomic bomb, I remembered the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him says, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. But he was no Vishnu because he was no god. He was more of a meddling titan, one who, upon intruding on the primordial realm, damned mankind forever with science and with hubris. We have made a thing, a most terrible weapon that has altered abruptly and profoundly the nature of this world, a thing that by all the standards of the world we grew up in is an evil thing. And by doing so, we have raised the question of whether science is good for man. A modern Promethean indeed. Okay, so it's been decided. He has to be punished. Time to determine the sentence. Now, woke abolitionists will tell you that you can no longer chain people to rocks or force them to push boulders up hills, let alone have eagles eat their livers. It's all part of abolishing the carceral mindset or whatever. The matter of holding characters accountable in fiction is already a contentious one, with people arguing about whether or not any antagonist from Kylo Ren to, like, I don't know, Lady Bird's mom were sufficiently punished by the narrative they're in. It's a very touch grass conversation that tends to consider some moral high ground over the point of view of the story without really engaging with the text most of the time. Not what we're here to discuss. But this does get much more complicated when it comes to telling stories of real people and real events, because you run the risk of your story romanticizing, defending, or even perpetrating real world atrocities. It's complicated because there's no real line between exploration and apologia, nor between responsible storytelling and propaganda. It's more of a weird spectrum that involves both artists' intent and audience perception. The Crown, for example, is helmed by a self-proclaimed royalist, but it's made me hate the royal family as much as any news about them. Then you have Dahmer Monster, which, regardless of the intent, was made without the approval of Dahmer's victims and which resulted in a lot of romantic apologia on the part of fans. So where does Oppenheimer, the movie, stand in this weird spectrum? Is it the romantic apologia that a lot of people expect that it would be? Does it defend the creation of the bomb? Does it gloss over the negative consequences of the Manhattan Project? Hell, is it United States military propaganda? The entire movie is purposefully split between two points of view, Oppenheimer's and Louis Strauss's, the latter of which gives us some insight into what happened with Oppenheimer after we leave behind his perspective. This gives us the opportunity to see both internal and external struggle with his actions. His own point of view expresses guilt since the talk celebrating the successful bombing, where it distorts his reality with gruesome imaginings of the bomb's effects. I feel that I have blood on my hands. Get off your knees and cut out this melodramatic bullshit! Let's go! In reality, Oppenheimer's guilt seems to have started even earlier, shortly after the first test of the atomic bomb. As stated in American Prometheus, a fellow physicist found him puffing on his pipe, and he's saying, those poor little people, those poor little people, referring to the Japanese. 
He said it with an air of resignation and deadly knowledge. The author promptly reminds us that, that very week, however, Oppenheimer was working hard to make sure that the bomb exploded efficiently over those poor little people. It was in reading this passage that I realized just how well Nolan captured the unimaginable anxieties that someone might feel in this unique position. He was determined to fulfill his mission, but was already feeling the consequences of an act that was yet to happen. Those are the words of a man who knows he'll never sleep well at night ever again. Meanwhile, Strauss's point of view shows us that Oppenheimer fought back against the government for years, desperately trying to influence atomic policy. This was made even harder once Strauss swooped in and orchestrated Oppie's fall from grace by way of revoking his security clearance. Indeed, as in the movie, Oppenheimer dedicated decades of thankless work to making sure nuclear weapons didn't proliferate and the super bomb wasn't created. As we know, and as the movie knows we know, he never succeeded. I am ready to go anywhere and do anything, but I am bankrupt of further ideas, and I find that physics and the teaching of physics, which is my life now, seems irrelevant. Hence, it would seem that Oppenheimer's punishment was much more Sisyphean than Promethean. He was punished seemingly by his own conscience and forced to do whatever it took to make it up for the role he played in the creation of the bomb, all the while outwardly rejecting that what he did was wrong. When visiting Japan in 1960, he was hounded by reporters who asked him how he felt about the bomb 15 years later. To this, he said, I do not regret that I had something to do with the technical success of the atomic bomb. It isn't that I don't feel bad, it is that I don't feel worse tonight than I did last night. Of course, this is the only real punishment that the real Oppenheimer ever suffered. He facilitated a war crime beyond comprehension and all he got was a guilty conscience. That movie shows us exactly that being his torment, but while true to history, a lot of people thought that the movie, as a post-mortem, should have done more to hold him accountable perhaps by showing the Japanese perspective of his actions. This request actually reminded me of similar discourse that sprung around the movie Tar and the way that it chose to punish its protagonist. Lydia Tar is a genius of in-universe classical music, but she is also a serial abuser. She built herself in the image of great bad men before her, specifically Leonard Bernstein, in order to reach a status that usually gatekeeps women, particularly queer women, like her. To get there, she rejects the use of identity labels. But it is odd, I, I think, that anyone ever felt compelled to substitute maestro with maestra. I mean, we don't call uh, women astronauts, astronauts. Mm -hmm. She's not maestra, she's maestro. Ich bin der Vater von Petra. And just like those men before her, she fell into the same abusive patterns against her inferiors. Which sets me off on a brief but important tangent. What about the great bad women? I would be remiss not to mention that this nuance that we are granting our great bad men isn't always extended to women in similar positions. On one hand, this is a historical issue, because female figures haven't been given nearly as consistent access to power and, consequently, greatness. More great bad women! When brainstorming for this video, I thought of Elizabeth, the favorite, the great, Marie Antoinette, and the crown, Stories about powerful women who did, one way or another, terrible things. What do they have in common? Royalty. One of the few ways in which women have been able to consistently achieve power. Greatness, for women, has to be God-given. And their terrible deeds involve upholding this power system. Most of these great bad women weren't punished though, were they? Neither in the real world, nor in fiction. If Elizabeth II is punished in the crown, it's when she fails to conform to the morally questionable system that she must adhere to. Loyalty to the ideal you have inherited is your duty above everything else. Because the calling comes from the highest source, from God himself. Yes. Do you really believe that? Monarchy is God's sacred mission to grace and dignify the earth to give ordinary people an ideal to strive towards, an example of nobility and duty to raise them in their wretched lives. Monarchy is a calling from God. 
After all, a queen's greatness is directly proportional to the way in which she respects and maintains the system around her. Royalty might be God-given greatness, but you still have to earn it, especially if you're not a man. And while you mourn your father, you must also mourn someone else. Elizabeth Mountbatten, for she has now been replaced by another person, Elizabeth Regina. The two Elizabeths will frequently be in conflict with one another. The crown must win. One who is punished for being royal, and famously so, is Marie Antoinette, who, at the end of Sofia Coppola's movie, is taken by the general populace for indulging in that same bad system, taken to prison to an ending so well known that Coppola doesn't even have to show us. She doesn't feel the need to remark upon the inevitable execution, or whether or not she deserves it, because she trusts the opulence of the movie so far to speak for itself. Marie Antoinette is a particularly interesting case of this great bad man archetype, because at least in terms of political influence and impact, as well as active participation in the bad oppressive system, her husband, the king, would be equally if not more responsible, but he himself is not nearly as fascinating to Coppola or to the general populace for that matter. The movie is specifically centered on Marie Antoinette, who, even at the time, was publicly much more maligned and collectively blamed for the systemic issues of the monarchy. It wasn't the elite, in general, who were hoarding wealth as the people starved. It was specifically Marie Antoinette's slavish spending that was bankrupting the country. And when they went to the Queen to tell her her subjects had no bread, do you know what she said? Let them eat cake. That's such nonsense. I would never say that. Therein lies the fascination with Marie Antoinette and, to a lesser degree, fellow female monarchs. She can be an active oppressor while also being a tragic figure. Which brings us back to Lydia Tarr and her failed attempt to get away with what countless men before her did. In the end, Lydia Tarr is relegated to finding a job in the Philippines conducting video game music for weebs at a convention. I saw plenty of accusations heralded against the movie, especially the ending, because of the way in which this punishment was perceived by the audience. Is it making fun of gamers? Is it making fun of the Philippines? No, dummies, it's making fun of her. This is beneath her to her. Although maybe it should make fun of gamers, they don't get made fun of enough. Tar is ultimately so fascinating because it shows us the tragedy of the accused, not in terms of having to own up to the consequences of their actions, but rather of their initial corruption, of the loss of both own and perceived humanity, of the original sin that tarnished the beauty forever. Time is the thing. Uh -huh. Time is, is the essential piece of uh, interpretation. You cannot start without me. See, I start the clock. Now, my left hand... It shapes, but my right hand, the second hand, marks time and moves it forward. However, unlike a clock, sometimes my second hand stops, which means that time stops. Hi, reshoots? What reshoots? By assuming control of her time, a primordial force, Lydia Tarr compares her own work to that of God. She grants herself the power of God, which is a very Renaissance way to look at the role of the artist that I personally adore. Michelangelo said that the true work of art was but a shadow of the divine perfection, and I agree, because to be an artist is to be a creator. The problem is when that godly role carries on to the world outside of the art-making through the relentless pursuit of greatness. Because what will happen when one of these imperfect gods heads out into the world to enact their own will? You're a rotten driver, I protested. Either you ought to be more careful or you oughtn't to drive at all. I am careful. No, you're not. Well, other people are. What's that got to do with it? They'll keep out of my way. It takes two to make an accident. Suppose you met somebody just as careless as yourself. I hope I never will. I hate careless people. That's why I like you. The assumption that everyone else will be careful is wrong, obviously, both in The Great Gatsby and in the real world. At some point, any given careless driver, a great person who believes rules don't apply to them, will clash with others. 
and those lesser people will be the ones to pay the price. They were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed up things and creatures and then retreated back into their money or their vast carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together and let other people clean up the mess they had made. Flawed greatness doesn't just destroy the great bad person, but those around them as well. And that's what's so heartbreaking in the end. That we've made it so that absolute talent corrupts absolutely. That pedestals are taken advantage of. That Kane's compassion, Oppenheimer's science, and Lydia Tarr's art could not fathom leaving power alone. In the end, internal punishment makes up for much more interesting character-driven stories than external punishment. Not to mention that without the sort of cosmic punishment we expect to hit Disney villains, the narrative ultimately allows the audience to get to the conclusion without having it spelled out for them. It puts us in the position of these figures and forces us to do the work of getting to the conclusion along with them. <laughs> so it's about time that we ask ourselves whether it really is a movie's job to punish characters or historical figures. Not only because that's too much to ask of fiction, but because it's a boring and childish thing to expect. I mean, I can only really think of one movie about a great bad man that actually genuinely managed to punish its subject. Orson Welles killed the reputation of William Randolph Hearst by inextricably linking him to Cain while he was still living. In fact, that made the narrative punishment, soul-crushing solitude leading to a lonely death, a hypothetical. Alone in his never-finished, already decaying pleasure palace, aloof, Seldom visited, never photographed. An emperor of New Sprint continued to direct his failing empire. Vainly attempted to sway as he once did. The destinies of a nation that had ceased to listen to him. Ceased to trust him. Hearst was a man who loved life. He had had some rough moments when he went bankrupt. But he loved a good time. The portrait of Hearst as this stolid, stooped, uh, bitter old man is totally wrong. But Citizen Kane exposed the artifice of Hearst's life for him. He had tried to purchase those around him all along, and that empty shell of love would eventually catch up to him. Whatever I do, I do because I love you. You don't love me. You want me to love you? Sure. I'm Charles Foster Kane. Whatever you want, just name it and it's yours. But you gotta love me. <laughs> Ironically, it was Hearst's own Susan Alexander, Marion Davis, who stuck with him until the very end. She was, perhaps, the only person who really loved Hearst, and for that, she was punished by his own family. Marion was barred by the Hearst family from his funeral for the sake of his reputation, since they never got married. They got rid of the only hint of his humanity to save that great man reputation. But Hearst's reputation was beyond saving. It would all but disappear over time, to be replaced by the fiction he hated, the movie he thought he'd killed, Citizen Kane. And while that's been the case to this day, it can't always be, particularly with dead people. So, do we really need for these bad people to be punished in order to get something out of their stories? Eighty years later, Citizen Kane continues to be regarded as one of the greatest films of all time, but what exactly continues to be its appeal? Because it's not its indictment of William Randolph Hearst, nor the way that it punished him. After all, Hearst is now mostly remembered for his very unflattering role in originating tabloid journalism in the United States, and his cultural footprint seems relegated to Citizen Kane footnotes and... I guess Newsies. Pulitzer and Hearst, they think we're nothing! Are we nothing? No! Remember Akhenaten and Nefertiti from like, I don't know, eight minutes into this three hour long video? As I mentioned then, their existence was consciously erased from historical records, which led to them being lost to time for millennia. But what was it that brought them back to us? Art. As Egyptologists Colleen and John Darnell said in their biography of the couple, ancient Egyptians wrote neither personal diaries nor biographies, so we cannot read the private thoughts of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. 
No ancient narrative of their rule has come down to us, and the ancient Egyptians do not appear to have written historical texts that cover a broad sweep of time. We can, however, experience the objects and places that were part of the royal couple's lives, and read speeches that Akhenaten made, hymns the king and queen recited, and records of historical events over which they presided. We can study the art and inscriptions of their reign, visit the tombs of their highest officials, and walk through their palaces. Our objects and artifacts last far longer than people, and they represent important ideas, history, identity, beauty. Similarly to Charles Foster Kane, we only have things to remember them by. We only have a barrage of objects they left behind, each telling a different story, often more accurately than the people who use them. And that is what has made Akhenaten and Nefertiti so fascinating, what manages to very strongly connect us to them and to understand them, which we don't always get to do with more officially documented ancient figures. If it was only up to historical traces, Akhenaten would simply be a forgotten tyrant and Nefertiti a pretty bust. This is how you end up with a Philip Glass opera about Akhenaten's unique vision of a monotheistic religion moved by love and connection with the universe. You give yourself the power to explore the inner workings of greatness, no matter how questionable. I am reminded of something that Bell Hooks wrote, that for her, forgiveness and compassion are always linked. How do we hold people accountable for wrongdoing and yet, at the same time, remain in touch with their humanity enough to believe in their capacity to be transformed. Obviously, we can't transform historical figures, but getting in touch with their humanity, especially while also holding them accountable, can be a great exercise in empathy. And not necessarily just with them, but also with ourselves. Because when he set off to explore the psyche of Charles Foster Kane and, by proxy, William Randolph Hearst, Orson Welles was also able to explore his own darkness and his own worst instincts. At the time, Orson Welles had already been placed on a path to greatness and not exactly by his own choice. He had been a boy genius all his life and now, at 24, having excelled in both radio and theater, he was lured to Hollywood with an unprecedented contract. He was given full go-ahead to create a great new project. Now all he had to do was make history. It's no surprise that he chose to do so by way of figuring out what greatness was all about. As he worked, he was fusing the character Charles Foster Kane completely with himself. His own brilliance, his greed, arrogance, ambition, he poured into Kane. But as Hausman remembered, we were also creating a vehicle suited to a man who, at 24, was only slightly less fabulous than the hero he would be portraying. And the deeper we penetrated into the heart of Charles Foster Kane, the closer we seemed to come to the identity of Orson Welles. Citizen Kane ended up being, in a lot of ways, a warped mirror for Welles to see what someone like him could end up as. Welles, too, had talent, ambition, and an ego. But, unlike Kane and Hearst, by all accounts, he wasn't a bad man, or even a nightmare to work with. He was, and is, well-loved. He didn't dedicate his life to the pursuit of greatness as much as his own artistic impulses. So it's in accessing these stories and their questionable points of view that we get to explore what active choices lead to greatness, or to badness, or to the overlap between the two of them. Maybe even some other hypotheticals outside of that. I argued against the atomic bombings, and yet somehow I feel like this is going to be the most controversial part of the essay. <laughs> anyway, uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda did something similar when he made Hamilton, a musical retelling of the life of founding father Alexander Hamilton, which recontextualizes the origin of the United States through a modern lens. This includes casting people of color as white historical figures, using styles of show tunes, hip-hop, and rap to portray differing political ideologies, and drawing overt parallels between the immigrant narratives of then and now. Hamilton is controversial, which I don't really care to get into, 
But I will say, I think it's a shame that a lot of the tractor's main takeaway from the show seems to be that it glorifies the Founding Fathers and not that individuals' actions, as well as the way we frame them, have an impact in the future. Here, Lin-Manuel Miranda, son of Puerto Rican immigrants, inserted himself into the narrative of a Founding Father to make a statement about his and fellow minorities' own place within the larger American experiment. Let's have another round tonight. Raise a glass to the four of us. Tomorrow there'll be more of us. He challenges the monopoly on history and identity and invites new voices into what constitutes being a part of the United States. At a personal level, though, by humanizing Alexander Hamilton, Miranda places himself in a position of both power and vulnerability. And in the face of ignorance and resistance, I wrote financial systems into existence. When my prayers to God were met with indifference, I picked up a pen, I wrote my own deliverance. He shows just how driven and smart Hamilton was, but also how him mishandling this negatively affected both his interpersonal relationships and the experiment of a nation in which he was participating. I wrote some notes at the beginning of a song, someone will sing for me, America, your great unfinished symphony, you sent for me! So, by writing the show and casting himself as Hamilton, Miranda grants himself power to inspire and implement something just as historically significant, but also bringing up the faults he sees in both Hamilton and himself. The looming threat of death, the pressures of fate and history, and a self-sabotaging downfall just waiting to happen. If I throw away my shot, is this how you remember me? Wait, oh my god, did Hamilton, like, predict Lin-Manuel Miranda backlash? Most importantly, he assumes responsibility over mending the gaps between us through storytelling. And when you're gone, who remembers your name? Who keeps your flame? Who tells your story? Who tells your story? Who tells your story? The show closes with a reminder that we have no control who lives, who dies, or who tells our story. And with this in mind, the spotlight falls not on Hamilton, but on Eliza, his often ignored wife, who arguably ends up being the most positive and long-lasting result of his legacy. Oh, can I show you what I'm proudest of? Similarly to Akhenaten and Nefertiti, Alexander Hamilton was consciously erased from history, or at least his role in creating the United States greatly diminished by his political opponents in subsequent years after his death. So it was up to Eliza to keep his legacy alive. Not just by making sure that his story was told, but also by championing causes in his name, positive causes, that have positive effects to this day. It's thanks to her that the musical even exists in the first place. Miranda himself allows her to combat ignorance and to claim Hamilton, both the name and the work, for herself as well. It's us who must assume the task of telling stories to make history an active, present conversation. I had to quickly rewrite this segment before filming because just this week I was like instantly moved to tears by a simple yet very risky creative choice in Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon, and I just had to geek out about it. So I'll try to be as vague as possible, but if you haven't seen it and would like to avoid some spoilers, uh, skip to this timestamp. Scorsese chooses to end his massive 200 minute long historical epic about Molly Burkhardt and the Osage Nation murders of the early 20th century, not with the usual title cards telling you what ended up happening to these people in real life, but with a recreation of a true crime radio show covering the murders. At first, it seems to be calling out the morbid, sensationalist way in which we tend to engage with these stories, until, suddenly, a heartbreaking moment of vulnerability on the part of the filmmaker. After a sharp, chilling, almost journalistic retelling of a horrible tragedy, in steps Scorsese himself to end his movie with a subtle but desperate plea for empathy for grief, and for remembrance, for this not to happen ever again. That's all he's asking of us. As Stephanie Sacharek said in her review for Time magazine, this is the best offering he can make to Molly Burkhardt. And still, 
he knows it's not enough. But perhaps my favorite instance of this kind of conversation with history is the general in his labyrinth. Here, Gabriel Garcia Marquez uses Simón Bolívar, a larger-than-life historical figure if there ever was one, to delve into both matters of national identity and our own relationship to history. It's wild to me that I even have to introduce Simón Bolívar because he's been like omnipresent throughout my life and like, Jesus, where do you even start? Uh, I've heard some people call him like the Latin American George Washington, but that doesn't even do the idea of him justice. You know, he's a libertador, the liberator. <laughs> the liberator. <laughs> the liberator. <laughs> He was instrumental in the independence and creation of Latin America, more akin to an originary myth than a real person. But still, Simón Bolívar was and is as controversial as he's been glorified into immortality. And it's those same flaws that make his wild history even more mythical. However, García Márquez doesn't depict any big historical events like, say, Hamilton does. Instead, he chooses to focus on a moment in which we have near zero information about, the two weeks in which Simón Bolívar was politically exiled from one of the many countries that he helped create and had to travel from Bogotá to the sea where he would board a ship and leave the continent once and for all. These two weeks would also be his last since he would die shortly before making it to the coast. By portraying the great liberator on this blank canvas of a moment, García Márquez gets to reflect on both the hits and misses of a huge life. Intimate historical fiction allowed him to expose the human within the liberator myth. It's fiction that draws us closer to history than history itself. It's particularly interesting that García Márquez never addresses Bolívar by name, He's always referred to as the general. The contrast between this larger-than-life idea and the frail, dying man that it refers to creates a sort of inescapable melancholy that weighs down on the reader with the full burden of history. Throughout the general's unknowing journey to his deathbed, the realities of living a life this large begin to close in on him, manifesting the titular labyrinth. The geographically messy country that he's forced to cross reflects the challenges of navigating society, politics, war, love, and history itself. This weight can genuinely crush a person. Towards the end, the general is so ill that his hosts urgently call the bishop over to hear his last confession. The general, however, rejects this rite and sends the old bishop away. When the doctor comes back in to check in on him, he tells him that. I never imagined this damn business was serious enough to even think about last rites, he said, and I don't have the good fortune to believe in the afterlife. It's not a question of that, said the doctor. It has been demonstrated that settling matters of conscience inspires a state of mind in the patient that facilitates the physician's task. The general paid no attention to the masterful reply, because he was shaken by the overwhelming revelation that the headlong race between his misfortunes and his dreams was at that moment reaching the finish line. The rest was darkness. Damn it, he sighed. How will I ever get out of this labyrinth? He never will, because the only way out of greatness is death. Despite the pop culture familiarity, nothing could have really prepared me to see a Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Yacht in person when I first visited Chicago a few years ago. You think you know what to expect, until you are seized by the massive scale of it. Suddenly there is only painting, only dots. The closer you look at it, the less you see, the less any of it makes sense. But take a step back, and it's all right there. 
pure beauty manifests in front of you in brave defiance to logic. It got me to really dive into Stephen Sondheim's Sunday in the Park with George, which I wasn't all that familiar with. It's a musical, the first act of which explores the intricacies of the creative process through the life of George Seurat, the artist behind this painting. Except that it's not really the life of Seurat, but a fictionalized projection of what painting the work could have been like. What we can only imagine it to be. But it's by borrowing the subject and painting that we are able to explore the painstaking process of creating something great, of the tiny little moments that actually create history as well as the story it lives behind. The second act of the musical creates George, a descendant of Surratt, an American artist in the 1980s that struggles with creating something new, especially under the shadow of his grandfather. He is experimental for novelty's sake, and he's failing to find any sort of meaning in the world of increasingly abstract and detached art. In their Pulitzer recommendation, jurors wrote that it shows an American artist experiencing a crisis of faith in his own creativity and finding strength and courage in a renewed connection with the past. Ultimately, for George and for Stephen Sondheim, there was power in elevating yourself to the position of the great. Why did you write these words? They are your words, George. The ones you muttered so often when you worked. That connection with the past is important because not only does it let us appreciate the vestiges of it more, such as art, but it also helps us understand the world where we live in now. You know, when done correctly and not just for the sake of nostalgia. Similarly to the myths of old. Anything you do, let it come from you. Then it will be new. We can see it applied to the things we love, such as in Sunday in the Park with George, but there's also a benefit in exploring the opposite. The bad people and the bad things that change the world for the worse the great bad actions of the great bad men. Christopher Nolan said of Oppenheimer that, like it or not, he made the world we live in for better or for worse. And he's correct. 80 years later, we still all live in the shadow of the terrible weapon that he made possible. It's a new world order based on military intimidation and the threat of mass destruction. But it was Christopher Nolan's focus on the causes, not the consequences of said development, that were subject to controversy. As summed up by historian Paul Hamm, we have a movie where the Japanese are relegated to basically a historical footnote. As a reflection of Oppenheimer's mind, the film cannot help but be morally half-formed. Why not show the Japanese victims? Why omit death from the movie about the destroyer of worlds? There is plenty of Japanese art that ponders on the consequences, be them historical, physical, or emotional, of the atomic bombings. But here, I would like to consult a Japanese perspective not on the atomic bomb, but on what it's like for one's scientific knowledge and creativity to be hijacked and corrupted by war. Hayao Miyazaki's The Wind Rises is a fictionalized biopic about Hiro Horikoshi, designer of the Mitsubishi A6M0, the plane used by the Empire of Japan to ruthlessly bomb China, Korea, the South Pacific, Pearl Harbor, and plenty of other places during World War II. It's a beautiful work of art and, in many ways, a Japanese counterpart to Nolan's Oppenheimer. Miyazaki, a plane enthusiast, was inspired after learning that, on the matter of designing aircraft, Hido Horikoshi said, All I wanted to do was to make something beautiful. From there, he went on to tell the story of an artist who dreamed of beautiful planes, but who was only able to go on to create them under the auspice of war. Through the inspired, gorgeously detailed portrayal of warplanes in the movie, Miyazaki explores the inevitable corruption of beauty. He shows us how political systems and propaganda machines harvest creativity for war and violence. It's not Horikoshi, man, who is bad, but the world around him. Because goodness, in spite of itself, can and will be weaponized as well. The movie, which Miyazaki released alongside an essay arguing against the remilitarization of Japan, was met with harsh criticism from Japanese conservatives, who called him an anti-Japanese traitor. 
but he didn't see it as such. He said that Horikoshi's planes represented one of the few things we Japanese should be proud of, a truly formidable presence. It's no secret that Hayao Miyazaki is very disdainful of the excessive commercialization of his work, and he constantly criticizes the consumerism that plagues the art of animation. This contextualizes The Wind Rises as a late-in-life celebration of the creation of beauty, because the creation of beauty alone is so rare that it is worth appreciating regardless of the consequences. But Miyazaki could only really communicate this by granting Horikoshi full control over his own point of view. By giving Oppenheimer this kind of power, the movie is unforgiving with its audience in regards to the cruelty of the subjects, often at full display, but even more so with the underlying story. In American Prometheus, Bird and Sherwin write about a young Oppenheimer that he wished to be engaged as a scientist with the physical world and yet detached from it. He was not seeking to escape to a purely spiritual realm. He was not seeking religion. What he sought was peace of mind. We can't end this war. But how do we justify using this weapon on human beings? We're theorists. Yes? We imagine a future, and our imaginings horrify us. But they won't fear it until they understand it, and they won't understand it until they've used it. The Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu scripture where the death destroyer of world lines come from, seemed to provide a young Oppenheimer with a philosophy that he needed for that. Another one of his favorite parts of the poem contained these lines. Vanquish enemies at arms. Gain mastery of the sciences and varied arts. You may do all this, but karma's force alone prevents what is not destined and compels what is to be. The movie doesn't fail to show other perspectives because it's doing that on purpose. Oppenheimer's challenge throughout, after all, is that he's always thinking about theory, not reality. His own perspective, not an objective one. Theory will take you only so far. At Los Alamos, there was no consideration for anyone else. The eventual affected were hypotheticals to scientists and generals, not real people. Pawns that are theirs to sacrifice, nothing more. If they're not in the movie, that's because they were never in their minds at all. That's the existential dread that follows you out of the theater. Not that Oppenheimer made the world evolve into a constant state of paranoid arming, but that mere human beings were so devoid of empathy and understanding that they were able to conjure up these evils in the first place. But as inhumane as these evils might be, humans were responsible. One human in particular. And if the movie is unforgiving with its audience, it's even more so with him. If the filmmaking wasn't already relentless enough, Kitty, Oppenheimer's wife, delivers the blow not once, but twice. Commit the sin, and then I was all feel sorry for you that it had consequences. You pull yourself together. The movie acknowledges that there is no justification for what he did. You can rationalize it all you want, or you can regret it ad infinitum, but there is no atoning for what happened, no erasing it from history. Ever. No matter how much Oppenheimer tried to make things right, he never could have. Did you think that if you let them tar and feather you, that the world would forgive you? It won't. And you know what the best part about it is? He would have hated that. And we know this because the real Oppenheimer got to react to a play made about him during his lifetime on the matter of J. Robert Oppenheimer in 1964. The ending of the play includes an extensive monologue by the character of Oppenheimer in which he expresses deep regret for what he did. The real Oppenheimer greatly disliked this because he said it lacked ambiguity. He stated that, What I have never done is to express regret for doing what I did and could at Los Alamos. In fact, on varied and recurrent occasions, I have reaffirmed my sense that, with all the black and white, that was something I did not regret. And so, Nolan refuses to grant Oppenheimer that ambiguity that he so desperately wanted. The movie is not glorification, nor is it apologia. It confidently damns Oppenheimer and chains him to his Promethean rock for eternity. Oppenheimer. 
When I came to you with those calculations, we thought we might start a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world. Mm, I remember it well. What happened? I believe we did. It does mythologize him. It puts us right in the mind of Oppenheimer as power blurs his reality into the tortuous existence that he deserves. But that's what myths are for, right? They are meant to convey unimaginable origins to unexplainable things. In antiquity, myths had to answer questions about the origins of the universe, of life, of us, and ironically, Oppenheimer himself was part of that wave of 20th century physicists who made those questions obsolete. To a degree. Now we have different questions, and some of them require even more complex answers. Legends are for heroes, but myths? Myths instill awe and fear. So what better myths to tell than those about the men who become death, destroyers of worlds? Hey yo, it's me, your boy. Do you want a behind the scenes look at what it takes to make a Jose Maria Luna video essay? Well, here's our camera. Here's our mic. Here's Celine. And here is the, cam the light that I am dangling out of the other window so that I can have a green light shining in through the window and into my face. We love that, don't we?